Trauma Therapist Podcast, Episode 71. Passion, dedication, and inspiration. If you're ready to hear inspiring interviews with amazing trauma therapists, this is it. Right here, right now. With your host, Guy McPherson. All right, guys, time again for some five-star shout-outs. Um, I just want to take a moment and really thank everybody who's gone to iTunes and left a review, left a five-star rating and review. It is so appreciated. Uh, you know, oftentimes doing a podcast can just feel like we're in the trenches, but having that feedback from you guys is awesome. So thanks to Andy Z, to Luke McClure, to Mark Helder, and uh, Oakley182, who says, as a PTSD sufferer and student in a trauma program, I love this show. It's great to bring the topic to light and to have a helping resource. Um, and that's exactly what my goal is with this podcast. So uh, awesome words, encouraging words to me. Uh, thanks so much, guys. All right, let's get to it. All right, folks, welcome back to the Trauma Therapist Podcast. My name is Guy McPherson, and uh, today I'm super excited to introduce my guest, Dr. Robert Muller. Robert, are you ready to go? I am. All right. Robert Muller, Trained at Harvard University, was on faculty at the University of Massachusetts, and is currently at York University in Toronto. Dr. Muller was recently honored as a fellow of the International Society for the Study of Trauma and Dissociation, ISSTD, for his work on trauma treatment. And his psychotherapy bestseller, Trauma and the Avoidant Client, in its third printing, has been translated and won the 2011 ISSTD Award for the year's best written work on trauma. As a lead investigator on several multi-site programs to treat interpersonal trauma, Dr. Muller has lectured internationally and has been the keynote speaker at mental health conferences in New Zealand and Canada. He founded an online magazine, The Trauma and Mental Health Report, that is now visited by over 100,000 readers a year. With over 20 years in the field, he practices in Toronto. All right, Robert, um... Nice little bio there. <laughs> um, obviously, just a little bit about makes, makes makes me sound good. Yeah. So take a moment, uh, just share with us, you know, where you're calling from and um, what it's like there, and then we'll dive in. Sure, sure. Well, I'm calling from Toronto, and um, uh, after this interview, I'm very excited to go up to Collingwood to do some skiing. Nice. So, Are you an avid, avid skier? I am um, okay. more in the last couple of years. Uh, uh -huh. Yeah, uh, despite a couple of accidents that were that were a little bit nasty, um, but uh, but yeah, it's, okay. it's fun. I enjoy it. Are you from Canada? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. 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 Uh, my uh, I I don't know if we're going to be touching on this later on, um, but uh, my um, my parents um, came over here in 1956. Um, they're uh, Hungarian uh, Jewish immigrants, and uh, uh, although I grew up with uh, with uh, Hungarian spoken in the family, um, I, I my first language is English, and no no French background at all, even though the country is uh, English and French. I have absolutely no uh, French Canadian background at all. Um, and, uh, but yeah, I grew up in Toronto in, in the uh, sort of the, for, for the American, it's really uh, the, uh, the Anglophone part of Canada. Nice. Okay. So let's, let's dive into it here. Um, sure, you know, this, sure. this podcast really is about highlighting your journey and it's a little different, you know, it's not simply how to treat trauma, but, uh, the purpose is to kind of go behind the scenes, find out what's inspired and driven you. And we first start out here with a quote, a mantra, share with our listeners something, uh, that's really kind of driven you in your, in your purpose here. Yeah. So the, the, the quote that, um, that, uh, I'm thinking of is, um, uh, actually not a trauma therapist who, who, uh, coined it. It was actually a survivor by the name of Marcia Tufekcic. And she, uh, is an individual who lived through the Bosnian war, um, and was a teenager at the time and went through uh, a significant uh, amount of trauma therapy, uh, a group therapy program there that was new at the time. And it's, it's interesting because she really, um, she had nightmares and flashbacks and, and went through this, uh, this treatment. And now she's a, a, a program director for, um, for an educational um, um, institute there to, to, uh, 
you know, to, to help with education around uh, what happened in Bosnia. But anyway, what she said was, quote, you have to pass through the trauma, through the biggest pain to continue normally, more or less normally with life. And I like that. The reason I like it because she makes it very clear that um, uh, recovering from trauma isn't just about um, getting over it. Uh, People who come in for therapy want to kind of leapfrog over the um, the suffering and um, what she makes clear is that by saying you have to pass through the trauma through the biggest pain that uh, the process of recovering is almost always painful and uh, and although at the end uh, people reach a point when they when they've been through therapy where they can um, bear thinking about and and can talk about what they've been through at the beginning it can be incredibly difficult and a lot of trauma survivors and she she included when she talked about her trauma recovery um um a lot of people at the beginning don't want to talk about it at all and and in fact i had a patient just the other day say to me is there any way that you can talk to my therapist who I saw for, you know, she saw a therapist for about a month uh, right after her um, um, her abuse uh, years back. Is there any way you could just call her and she can tell you what happened to me so that I don't have to, to talk about it with you? Mm-hmm. And, you know, that, that, that fantasy that you can just kind of get over it without actually having to pass through the pain is something that a lot of trauma survivors have. Um, and it's very understandable, but, but, um, in her quote, she makes it really clear that that, that's something you really have to pass through to, Mm -hmm. to be able to reach a point where you, you know, you can continue more or less normally with life. When did that become evident to you? When did this quote kind of, uh, become resonant for you? Well, I heard this interview on the CBC about um, two years ago. So this, uh, you know, but so it was actually after I had had written my book, Trauma and the Avoidant Client. But so I'd already been thinking about this idea of, you know, people wanting to, um, you know, in one, on one hand wanting to deal with it, but on the other hand wanting to avoid it. I mean, it's, it's ambivalent. Um, so I've been thinking about that idea of, of, of people's mixed feelings around actually having to talk about their trauma history for a while. But when I, when I heard her talk about this, I thought, okay, that encapsulates it really nicely. And I like it that she's, you know, she's someone who's actually been through this and, you know, knows, right? I mean, she's, she's felt it. Yeah. And how do you spell her last name? Uh, okay, sure. It's, uh, it's Marcia Tufekchich, um, T-U-F-E-K-C-H-Y-C-H, I believe. That's, okay. That, that's my guess. All right, I got <laughs> it. I got guess, it. Yeah. All right. So let's, let's move on here. You know, people sure. get into this field for a number of reasons. I've often talked about my, uh, one of, one of my main inspirations, you know, was my brother and him coming back from uh, Iraq as a Navy SEAL with PTSD and uh-huh. me, me just flubbing it, blowing it, and just doing everything incorrectly. Um, obviously, everyone has a different story, but t- tell us your story, Robert. What got you into this field? Why, why trauma? Sure, sure, yeah. So my, my parents um, uh, are Holocaust survivors. They were children during the Holocaust, and... Um, um, it's it's interesting growing up um, with with uh, parents who who were children during the Holocaust because it's not quite the same as um, people who were obviously people who were adults who who knew a lot more about what was going on. So, for example, my mother was six at the time, and so much of it, you know, if you sort of filter th- uh, the kind of um, being in the midst of a situation where you really know. You could, you can die. You can be, you can, you really have a very good chance of being killed to be six years old and to, to, to have that for a sustained period of time. So Hungary was occupied for about eight months, um, towards the very end of the war. And that's, and so my, my, um, mother and her sisters were separated in order for them to survive. My, my, their, their parents put them into, uh, uh, separate separate homes um, of non-Jewish uh, friends or or, uh, or relatives, 
And, um, and it was the same thing for my father as well. Um, he was, he was 10 years old. And so, um, I grew up with stories, a lot of stories, and some of them were very, very painful. And some of them were also surprisingly, um, you know, uh, uh, I mean, I wouldn't say, uh, pleasant, but, but, um, surprising. So, cause for, for example, kids, kids were still kids at the time. And so they would find whatever they could find to play with. And, uh, and, and they, they did what they could do. My father tells a story about how his uncle, um, and he had to hide the family, um, uh, uh, I wouldn't say jewels, but, but, uh, but, uh, they had, they had some gold and they, they had some, they had some, um, uh, precious, precious stones. So they actually literally went into the basement and made a little, um, mental map and had to dig and literally hid the family's, um, jewelry in the basement. And only my father and his uncle knew where, what, you know, where these, these precious stones were. Um, and so people were doing whatever they could do to survive and, and, um, um, growing up for me, hearing all these stories, I just assumed everybody's parents had gone through the Holocaust, right? I mean, like, that's what you, that's what you know, that's what I thought. And so, you know, when I would meet like in, in, um, and I also went to a Jewish school, so I was a little bit sheltered when I was younger. And then, you know, in, in high school, I, you know, my, my world expanded a bit more and I, I, I started to meet people who, whose parents, um, who, who were Jewish and whose parents grew up in, in, uh, in Toronto and did all kinds of normal things like went to dances when they were younger and listened to the Beatles. And I thought, Wow, people actually did that. Parents did that. That that's really weird. You mean like what did they do during the Holocaust? Oh, they were like across the ocean. It was a completely different world. So for me, I was immersed in this idea of of pe- like it was just an assumption that people lived through traumatic experiences. Um, I also had friends whose parents um, went through the Holocaust and whose whose parents never talked about it. It was completely hush hush. You could never say. In fact, some of them wouldn't even admit that they were Jewish because it was so uh, frightening. Um, you know the 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 sort of the uh, what the parents had been through. So they raised their kids um, denying that the kids were were actually Jewish. Um, so so this is this is something that's really shaped my my world view. Um, and, uh, um, you know, even, even to this day, it's interesting when I talk with my mom on the phone, sometimes, you know, if, if I'm talking about something that has to do with, um, money, she'll say, shh, shh okay, okay. You know, don't, don't speak too loudly. Right. You know, kind of the walls have ears mm-hmm. kind of mentality. And, and I, and I think back and go, oh yeah, right. Of course. Yeah. That would make sense that she would sort of really have, have that kind of, um, you know, world, world view that you've got to be really, you've got to be cautious, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, it's, it's a different kind of world than, than when you're, you know, in, in the world I grew up in, obviously, uh, you know, I, I, I grew up in Toronto. It was com- you know, completely free. It was not, you know, nothing, nothing like what, what my parents had been through. Um, so yeah, I think that's, that's something that kind of led me to, toward this. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I think if I think about the kind of from 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 my earlier experiences. Yeah, a g- great story there. So you and I've I've heard this before. Where, but but you grow up in this environment where you hear all these stories, and I think interestingly, as you said, you know, you thought, well, doesn't every parent have these experiences? Does, hasn't every parent lived through this Holocaust? Mm. Lived lived through traumatic events? And was how did that those stories translate into that? pull for you to begin working in this field? Um, I think, I think, um, uh, it, it was more of a, uh, I mean, when I say that it, it affected me, I think I'm, I'm, I'm speaking as someone who's post going through psychotherapy. I mean, this is not something I was aware of mm-hmm. when I really, um, started to be interested in this. I think when I, when I, so my, the therapy that I went through, um, was, uh, during, during graduate school. And I, I think I, I came to realize that my interest in working with trauma survivors stems from, um, my family background after I had already, um, 
started working in the field. And so I think it was unconscious. Yeah. Uh, my, you know, I think, um, and I only sort of realized, okay, hang on a second. Why am I so interested in this? Mm-hmm. So, I mean, I just, you know, I mean, you know, consciously, uh, there was a professor who was doing work in this and I thought he was kind of a really cool guy and I wanted to work with him, you know, consciously. So, but I think, you know, and we worked together, we really clicked and, and, and in grad school I started to get into it. But I think it was through my therapy that I realized, okay, you know, this is not just about, you know, I mean, he was a nice guy and all that, but that's not what this is about. What this is about was really more of my earlier history. And I came to kind of realize that, um, through, through, through my therapy, um, and, and understanding a little bit better, um, some of the ways that I think, um, for my, you know, like for my parents, um, you know, being a child during the Holocaust also means it's, it's, it's for sure being terrified a lot of the time, but it's also, it also means losing your childhood. And so there's this kind of way in which I think, um, you know, I, I value childhood, I value playfulness, I value, you know, that sort of thing. I think to some extent it's kind of a, um, and again, this is kind of post therapy that I kind of came to realize it, that I think in some ways it's kind of a, perhaps a kind of a way of repairing maybe some, mm-hmm. some ills from the past, I think. And, and again, I, I think all that kind of happened very un, unconsciously. I, I wasn't aware of it at the time as I, as I was really getting into the work. Sure. Sure. So let's kind of focus here, shift focus rather, and let's talk about kind of an early clinical error uh, or mistake you made and, and share what you learned from that. And, I, and what I'm going to do a little bit different here, Robert also is, um, last week I was interviewing uh, Dr. Frederica Bannock, whose book is uh, Post Traumatic Success. And she kind of stopped me when I, when I asked her this question. And she said, Well, that's very kind of, um, you know, it's not positive focus, it's not strength based. What about, you know, looking at, at a success also? So I'm also going to ask you, and I'm kind of putting you on the spot here because I didn't prep you for it, but uh, I'm going to ask you for, for a success. Uh, little story after, but let's start with a with an early clinical error and uh, kind of share with us how what you learned from that. Sure. Yeah, okay. <laughs> That's funny because I actually really like the idea of focusing. I, I think it's frankly a little bit boring to to, to focus <laughs> too much on my successes. Right. Um, uh, I, I mean, I think um, uh, I, um, I, I think that. Um, it's it's in many ways much more instructive to focus on on the things that you've done that that you think okay I, I can learn from that but but sure yeah let me let, let's I'm, I'm happy to to uh, to uh, to address to address those sure so um, so thinking about um, a case where uh, I, I I feel like I learned a lot from where 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 I would do I would do things differently and and uh, um, certainly there were there were some some significant errors in the beginning. Um, so this is a fellow. Um, let's call I'm going to call him Paul. This is a guy who I must have worked with about uh, must have been about ten years ago. And um, Paul was uh, he was an interesting guy. At the time, I worked at a um, at a, a clinic uh, on on campus. I'm a professor at York University, but I also did a little bit of clinical work at a, at a general uh, medical clinic on campus. And um, uh, psychologists in in Ontario. Uh, aren't covered by the national health care plan. So people have to pay out of pocket or they have to purchase extended health benefits. So the reason that's relevant is that, um, you know, the, the, the big long line that people have to wait in for this clinic, most of them were, were um, um, health insurance clients. And the reason this is relevant is because it's relevant to my client. He would get really annoyed. So he would cut to the front of the line and say, you know, oh, I'm paying out of pocket. I shouldn't have to wait like this, um, uh, like in the, in the line where, where everybody is, who's, 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 you know, got insurance coverage and, you know, um, so he would be, you know, he'd be kind of in a sense, impolite and, um, a little bit entitled, um, and the secretaries, of course, at the clinic hated him and they, they called him that Paul. And, you know, they would ask me, you know, you've been working with this guy for four months. How, how long does this therapy stuff take anyway? <laughs> you know, they'd get really irritated. And, um, and, and frankly, the truth is I didn't like him either. Um, 
I found him, uh, as I say, annoying, entitled. Um, I, I found him uh, very difficult. I think I was just kind of getting through sessions rather than really engaging. Um, and I had been working with him for about six months when um, at some point he, he uh, in, in a session, he says to me something like, um, um, yeah, I was, I was at home for the weekend. Uh, yeah, I was in, I was in my bedroom, you know, and you know, where, where I noticed all that stuff that happened with my, with my father, you know, and I said to him, you know, with your father, what, 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 what do you, what are you referring to? He goes, no, I told, didn't I tell you about it? And he hadn't told me about it. And I said to him, uh, well, no, well, you know, remind me. And I knew that his father had passed away, uh, when he was in his early twenties, um, but I, you know, I didn't really know why and, um, with the circumstances. And, you know, when I was seeing Paul, he was in his, he was in his early forties. And so he says to me, um, he tells me the story and he says, yeah, well, you know, and, and the story went something like this. When Paul was in his, when, when he was in his twenties, he was at home, um, for, for a weekend and he was in his, uh, in his bedroom and he noticed outside the window um, that in the garage there was there was smoke coming out, and uh, he's you know there's smoke coming out of the garage, and he he knew his dad was in the garage. He figured he was doing some some work there or something. I don't know. He didn't know, so he 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 calls to his mom to call nine one one. So his uh, you know mom does that, and he rushes out to the garage, opens the door, he he looks inside, and he sees his dad. And, um, th this dad was what I did know about him was that, uh, his father was the, the great Italian Canadian immigrant, um, you know, was kind of how he saw the story, you know, kind of, you know, he came to Canada with $5 in his pocket, um, built a business up from, you know, he, 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 uh, started out by laying tiles. He then became a contractor, worked his way up to be a very successful developer who was wealthy so I knew that, you know, I knew about this, this great man that he idealized. Um, and, uh, um, and so, uh, he tells me that, uh, he, his, uh, his, he, he goes into the garage and he sees his father. His father is in the car, the engine's on, uh, there's a hose from the exhaust into the window. His father is trying to kill himself. So this, um, great man who he had up on a pedestal was trying to kill himself. Okay. So he pulls his dad out of the car and, uh, out, out into the, out of the garage, starts doing whatever limited CPR he knows how to do. And his, um, his, the, uh, paramedics arrive within a few minutes, right? And they revive his dad, bring him to the hospital. And, uh, his dad, um, is there for a few days, probably about a week for, for, um, for, uh, interviewing and, and, and assessment. And they discharge his dad. Three weeks later, his father successfully kills himself. So why am I telling this story? Um, I'm telling the story because of what finding out that story did to me and to my working relationship with Paul. I realized after um, uh, a while that I suddenly liked him more. And isn't that weird? I went from this position of not liking this guy, not really seeing him as connected to the therapy, to kind of thinking about him after sessions. And I never thought about him. I didn't like the guy. I thought he was difficult. I thought he was a big pain. But I, I started to think about him and I started to ask myself, what was going on for me that I couldn't connect to him? And I think it was about me more than about him. And I think it was about something about, you know, his story um, touched, touched a nerve. I mean, my, as I said, my parents were Hungarian Jewish immigrants. In many ways, my father arrived in Canada with very little money in his pocket and built a big business. I think there was a, um, a kind of a, a connection that I had with him that I also wanted to, to, uh, to eschew, to kind of, to kind of turn away from that I couldn't handle as well. Um, and I also think that his airs of superiority, 
um, I think I reacted in, in, a, in, a, in a counter-transference kind of way and, and, and kind of got intimidated and got, and, and, and got drawn into a, a bit of an enactment where I came to, to dislike him. And, and maybe that's something that he needs to do or needed to do at the time. And maybe it was just a little bit too hard for him to be vulnerable. Um, but whatever he did, I bought into it hook, line, and sinker, instead of giving him the space to really be vulnerable, um, the safety that's required for people to actually be able to do therapy. Once I was able to actually really hear his story and, and could connect to him and, and like him on a basic level, you know, maybe it's because he suffered a bit. And I, and I was like, oh, okay, all right, I, I, I get this a bit more. Um, then I feel, I feel like at, at about six months of therapy, that's when we actually said hello mm. and we were able to start the work and it was cause of me. So that's, that's an interesting case for me, a case where I learned from. And, and to me, it also says like, if you're finding that you're kind of not connecting, ask yourself, what's going on for you? You know, what, what's, what the heck's going on? Normally I do connect with clients. What's going on with me, with this person that I'm, 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 I'm keeping him at arm's length as much as he's keeping me at arm's length. Um, and what's going on here? And yeah. it was a good, it was a good learning experience, I think. Wow. Phenomenal story, Robert. So yeah. you're, you're, you begin working with this guy who is is what entitled is maybe rude yeah. secretaries don't like him and you talked about you being in session with him and also having that certain feeling what did therapy look like for with the two of you during that time when when you didn't like him what was the shift when, there when i did or didn't when you did not like him so when i didn't when i was when i was not able to connect with him it was um, it was boring. Mm. It was um, unemotional. Um, we did a lot of circling around, you know, a lot of circling around issues without ever really landing on anything. Um, you know, he would complain. And I think I, I fell into a complacent place where I would let him complain. I mean, he, he came in, you know, uh, to, to his credit, he, he came in. And I think the reason he was coming in was there was a part of him. I mean, I think a lot of these things are ambivalently held. I think there was a part of him that did want to actually open up um, uh, and, uh, and, and did want to actually deal with the um, – the, the things that he does to push people away. I mean, he, he, he did a lot of things to, to keep people at arm's length, um, really ultimately as a self-protective kind of mechanism. But I wasn't able to really see that until I was. And then, and then when I was able to see that, that's when things really shifted. Mm -hmm. um, and it was, it was dramatic. I mean, it was interesting. After that happened and once I was able to connect to him more, um, I became much more mindful of what his affective states were, you know, what was he feeling? Um, if he was blocking, I started to notice that more, you know, that he was actually, um, blocking on something that he had, you know, that he had dropped a little subtle emotional thing and then covered it up. And I, I was able to see this now more than I, I had been able to before. And maybe he also had a little bit more space to be able to reveal parts of himself that didn't feel really ultimately safe enough before that to reveal. So there was a, there was a quite a dramatic shift and then the next you know um, six months to a year of work was was a lot more productive and we were able to get to things that that were there were actually a number of other um, po uh, post-traumatic incidents uh, sorry traumatic incidents that he had post-traumatic um, symptoms uh, in relation to that we were able to get to later on and um, and, and actually it ended up being quite a good uh, quite a good therapy Awesome. Awesome story. Yeah. Thanks so much for sharing that. I mean, there's just like sure. so many gold nuggets for our listeners here um, that we could just catalog under advice. But um, let's move on. Uh, I'm going to kind of, uh, in the interest of time, I'll uh, maybe have you back and we can talk about your successes. But um, let's get to one of my favorite questions, which is, you know, why we get into this, why we're doing this. I mean, I, I just believe the answer to that really uh, kind of highlights and, and fuels our purpose, our, our motivation. Share with our listeners, Robert, why you're doing this day to day. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Sure. Happy to. So, um, so again, um, so I'm going to sort of just say that I, I think, um, I, I think again, it was probably 
in, in my own personal therapy that I came to understand that a bit better. Um, I, I think to some extent I'm susceptible to, to, um, you know, what's been called in the literature rescue fantasy. Um, I think, I, I think there's a way in which I really connect to the idea of, of, kind of rescuing people from, from themselves in some ways. And, and I think that it relates, um, to some personal, um, uh, trauma that I experienced. So I talked a little bit about, um, kind of my, my family background, but, but for me personally, uh, I went through some, some quite severe bullying when I was uh, a teenager and, um, it, it was, you know, it lasted for, for several months and it was, it was, it was unrelenting for a while there. And when, when you've been through that, um, and, and there are times that you really, uh, you know, when, especially if it's, um, I mean, I think, I think there's a way in which we tend to see a lot of the psychological bullying in girls. And I think, uh, I think the, the popular kind of notion is, oh, well, with guys, it's, it's, it's a much, it's, you know, guys dust themselves off and, and, and they're over it pretty quickly because it's just kind of a physical thing. And once the physical danger passes, they're okay. But there's psychological bullying with guys too. Um, and uh, that's something that I, I did actually personally experience. And I think that it, it affected me. And it, there's, there's no doubt, um, you know, to be really, to, be, to feel kind of severe levels of fear and, and anxiety in relation to your social group. Um, and, you know, I mean, I grew up in, in a, a kind of a working class neighborhood. As I said, I was, um, uh, a child of, of, as I said, Hungarian Jewish immigrants. And, 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 um, so there were a lot of, it was, it was, it was a bit of a, it was a bit of a rough, uh, a rough neighborhood. And, uh, there was, there was a lot that, um, um, uh, you know, a lot of times that, you know, you had to really, I had to really kind of, uh, uh, avoid certain paths cause it would, it could be really quite dangerous. Um, the, the feeling of being afraid, the feeling of thinking that you're all alone in this. That's something that I think I, I, I felt when I was, when I was a, a, a young teenager at, at, at the time that I went through a lot of this stuff, feeling like I'm on my own. I, I didn't think there was anybody I could talk to. I mean, I, I, I didn't even think I didn't even think you would talk to anybody about it. It wasn't so much, oh, there's nobody I would. I didn't even imagine that you talked with anybody about it. Like, why would you do that? I just, I mean, it didn't even enter my mind, the idea that you could actually talk to someone about it and that there's actually someone who could help you. And yeah, it, it would never even cross my mind. And so that kind of, that kind of way of thinking about things, I think has, has affected me and, and, and makes me, um, uh, um, it, it draws me toward wanting to, to engage in, 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 in helping and, and that kind of thing. I think, I think it's, you know, and when I say rescuing, it's a bit of a double edged sword. You know, you can, you can, it's a good feeling to feel that you've, that, that, that people who have, who have suffered are suffering less. Uh, that's, that's a really good feeling. It's special. Um, it's a bit of a double edged sword though. And it can get you into trouble, especially if you get too drawn into that way of thinking, the, the idea of I can rescue people, because there's, there's a limit to what you can do. And, and you, can only, you can't really rescue people from themselves. And, and you don't want to be in a situation where you're rescuing people to the extent that they're now taking advantage of you um, as, as a therapist. And so, so those are things that I have to keep in check always. I have to be very mindful of my own tendency, uh, to, to, to try too hard to, to try to try harder than the patient, let's say, um, rather than letting them, you know, in a sense, take responsibility for, for change. So I, but, but I think then in terms of the question of why, um, I, I, I think that that answers it. I mean, I, 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 I feel like that, I feel like that's to me that, that feels right in terms of why. Yeah. I appreciate that. I, I think it, it certainly does answer it. And I also appreciate you, uh, you know, ta sharing that, uh, story and that information with us and our listeners. And I think it's, um, great that you just made that distinction between the psychological bullying and the physical bullying and uh, pointing out that psychological bullying does, you know, occur with, with males and it certainly does have an impact. And, 
Mm. Uh, I know firsthand as well about that. So um, yeah, I think it's just a great, Great lesson for our listeners to hear. And, you know, the, the way you talk, Robert, uh, I, I just think there's so much information in what you say and in how you say it. And in your book, um, you know, The Avoidant Client, which we're going to have linked up in the show notes page at westcoasttraumaproject.com, um, you know, I shared with this uh, with you before in our kind of pre-interview chat. I think your book is amazing. And I'm not just saying that because you're on this podcast, but I think it's amazing and incredible for trauma therapists of all levels because not only does it talk about uh, kind of the impact of trauma, but it really gives therapists uh, ideas uh, about how to do trauma therapy in a sense. And obviously things are different. Clients are different. It's not a boilerplate by any means, but I'm saying it really, through your own experiences, gives a therapist an idea of really how to engage and interact with clients. And a lot of books don't do that. So I think your book really kind of stands out uh, and does that uh, incredibly well. Thanks. I appreciate that. I, 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 um, was hoping to to write something that people can connect to, the therapists can connect to, and that um, um, that people feel, oh yeah, yeah, that does that does describe my clients. So I, I, I was I was trying hard to um, use cases from my practice, um, you know, uh, you know, uh, protecting the uh, identifying information, but using actual cases where um, where things went well, things didn't go well, you know, what what leads you know, what leads you into a better or worse direction in working with people. So I was, tr- I was trying really hard to make it something that people could connect to. Yeah. Awesome. All right. So, you know, obviously throughout this interview, you've shared a lot, given a lot of advice, uh, but right now I kind of want to uh, force you in a sense to kind of bullet point and, and share with our listeners, um, again, who are of varying levels, you know, some of uh, the listeners are uh, therapists specializing in trauma. Others are therapists who've been working for a while but don't believe uh, that they've worked with individuals who've been traumatized. But share with our listeners advice you have for people who are maybe just getting into this field. Sure, yeah. Um, so uh, one thing uh, I would definitely say is get therapy. If you haven't been in therapy before, it is really hard to do trauma work without your own therapy. And the main reason is because of point number two that I want to make, which is uh, 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 having a focus on countertransference. So let me, I'll just speak about that just for a moment. So by countertransference, I mean the, the feelings, thoughts, and behaviors that the therapist brings the personal feelings, thoughts, and behaviors that the therapist brings into the therapy situation. Um, and uh, we, you know, we all, we can't help but feel things in relation to our clients. Um, and you want to, you want to notice your feelings. And by noticing feelings, I mean, if you're feeling intimidated, if you're noticing that, if, if, if you, if you're, you know, um, you know, making special rules for certain clients, um, letting yourself in a sense, uh, be potentially taken advantage of, or, or, or you become a little bit too harsh with certain clients where you, you know, become a little bit too rigid around, around rules in a way that's uncharacteristic for you or the normal way that you practice, you want to ask yourself, what's going on here? Like what, what's different here for me, uh, relative to the normal way that I work? Um, what in this client is bringing up certain feelings that are personal for me and how am I acting on those feelings? Therapists can't help but feel things in relation to their clients. Um, the trick is uh, noticing those feelings as soon as possible before you act on them. And if you do act on them, noticing that as soon as possible. So by acting on them, it could be something very simple, like, you know, like, you know, like I say, um, um, uh, a client who who's you know starting to repeatedly come late, and you know you don't feel like you can say anything about it because oh well, I don't want to upset him. Well, why not? What why is therapy not supposed to upset people? I mean, uh, right? I mean, like, what, what's what what is it that you're how what are you protecting against? Uh, you know, how, how are you protecting yourself, or why are you protecting the client from from certain feelings? So what's going on if you're if you're enacting certain 
um, uh, dynamics in the therapy uh, room with the client if you're acting on your countertransference. What's going on? So noticing that early on is really important. Having a, a framework of noticing countertransference and having your own therapy really helps. So if you've never been in therapy before, um, it's, it's extremely important that you have a, a reputable therapist that you work with, um, for, I, you know, you want, you want to have, you want to explore some of your earlier, um, dynamics, uh, difficulties, um, struggles. If you have any traumas from your past, you want to explore that and be attentive to that. A third piece of advice that, that I would, I would say is, um, get supervision. Trauma therapy is really hard to do without the benefit of having a good supervisor. So I, I have a, a um, a, f a few people who I work with, we do some co-supervision. One of those people is, is my wife, who's a, who's a psychiatrist. Um, so we, we talk about cases, um, uh, and, and, and we do co-supervision, but I also do co-supervision with, with some other colleagues. It's really helpful to have a co-supervisor that you, you know, that you can, discuss cases with and where you feel that there's safety in the discussion. So you can, you can come in and say, oh, I really messed up with so-and-so today, you know, with this client or that client. Um, I really need some help with it. What's going on for me? And, and where, the, where the person can challenge you you know, a little bit to sort of explore, okay, well, what is going on with you? Normally you don't mess up that badly. What's, what's going on here? Um, so you want to be able to have that, that kind of, that kind of space. Fourth bullet point I would say would be the idea of vicarious trauma to really be attentive to how working in trauma, again, if you haven't had a lot of experience with this, but even if you have a uh, senior therapist think that they can handle stuff you know, well, I'm, you know, I'm a therapy rock star. I've done this for a long time. I know what I'm doing, blah, blah, blah. You know, no, no, it doesn't work that way. Even if you've been doing it for a long time and you know, and you, you know, you know a thing or two, you are susceptible to vicarious trauma, which means that, you know, through the process of sitting with certain people, um, if you get touched in very personal ways, uh, emotionally, you can start to carry this with you and you can have, you, you can have flashbacks. It can affect your relationships. It can affect your sex life. It can affect your, your, um, your parents that that you do with your own children so you want to be attentive to that if you're finding that something in in the material with a client is uh, or in the relationship with a client is is um, triggering things for you and and if if that's the case you want to start to engage in self-care and self-care means um, you know taking taking breaks like scheduling breaks um, making sure that you have a co-supervisor to talk to about cases and you're not dealing with a really difficult trauma case alone. Um, that's part of, that's an important part of um, the process as well. So those, those are some of the things that I would say for certainly for early, for early starting out therapists, but I would say for senior ones too, we forget a lot of these things. And we take, yeah. You know, we think, you know, that you know, we're, uh, you know, not susceptible to this stuff, but we are. Awesome. All right. So we've got uh, get therapy, uh, have a focus on counter transfers, counter transference, obviously notice what's going on with your own feelings and actions, uh, get supervision, be attentive to vicarious traumatization, and uh, also talked about the importance of self care. Yeah. Um, Robert, two go to books um, that you could recommend, either trauma related or not. And obviously, your book is going to be up here in the show notes page as well. So. Sure. Okay. So my, my book is Trauma in the Avoidant Client, and that focuses on working. It really focuses on the challenging client, the client who um, has a trauma history, but is in many ways um, help rejecting, reluctant to deal with it, um, really ambivalent about whether they want to actually get help. So there's a part of them that that's there because things aren't working well, but there's a part of them that's saying, no, no, I don't want to deal with this. It's too upsetting. And so when um, they get close to talking about anything that creates feelings of vulnerability, they back away and sometimes back away from the relationship with the therapist, sometimes back away from, from, um, 
emotions and and become very concrete or very very uh, intellectualized. Um, those can be really challenging clients to work with. So 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 my book helps people deal with clients like that. Uh, sometimes avoidance is seen in ways that are not obvious. So a number of clients who are diagnosed with dissociative disorders or with borderline personality also have avoidant attachment patterns, which means that they may get, you know, they may be labile or they may be um, affected by emotions in ways that, that sometimes can feel uncontrollable to them. Um, yet in other contexts, they cut off feelings. And they turn their attention away. They turn their attention away from vulnerable or difficult, painful feelings. And so um, those can be really challenging to work with as well. And I cover that kind of those kinds of issues as well in my book. So I think that that's something and there there actually isn't anything else specifically that that deals with that. Um, Another book that I would say that I, I really would highly recommend is uh, a book by James Chu, C-H-U, called Rebuilding Shattered Lives. He's got a second edition of that now. And um, uh, it's, uh, I think, maybe 2011, I believe, his book. Um, anyway, he focuses on um, trauma therapy, kind of nuts and bolts, and how you work with people who have complex trauma histories. He also focuses on the issue of memory, which is very interesting. You know, the question of people who, um, you know, during sessions have, um, you know, start to remember material about their past that maybe they hadn't previously ever, ever thought of, um, or hadn't remembered. And, um, that is something that's a very interesting issue, uh, to, um, to, 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 to look at. And, and his, his book uh, really nicely explores that also some really interesting case studies. So those, those would be two, two that I would recommend. Okay. So we've got, um, trauma and the void and client attachment based strategies for healing, um, by Robert Muller yourself and rebuilding shattered lives, treating complex PTSD and dissociative disorders by James Chu. Uh, in the links in the show notes page, Robert, um, we're going to have, well, first of all, what's the best way for people to get in touch with you? So I think the best thing to do would be for them to Google. So they're, they're, the simplest would be to Google trauma and the avoidant client Facebook so they can get to my, uh, professional Facebook page. Um, they can also Google my blog, which is talking about trauma so that's a, a psychology today expert blog, and I have articles every um, week uh, on trauma and trauma therapy or mental health issues. Um, so that's my blog, talking about trauma. It's a psychology today blog, and then I also have my online magazine. And it, these they can just Google; it'll be like the, the, they'll they'll come up very high in their hits. Um, if they Google talking about trauma or Google uh, my book um, with uh, the Facebook uh, attached, or um, they could also Google my magazine, which is trauma and mental health report. So that's an online magazine um, that, that uh, focuses on the topics of trauma and mental health. And um, that, and short of that, they can also, people can also um, uh, uh, email me, uh, and it, you can find that pretty easily by just going to my York University webpage. So just Google me at Robert T. Muller. So you, you need the T in there. Otherwise, you'll get the Robert Muller FBI um, guy. <laughs> and so that, that won't get you very far or well, it'll get you in the wrong direction. <laughs> um, so Robert T. Muller, M-U-L-L-E-R. And just Google me and then you can get to my um, uh, web, uh, my um uh, university webpage. My my email address is there. All all, all the stuff to, to specific contacts, phone, and all that stuff. Awesome. And we'll link that all up in the show notes page, uh, Facebook page, um, the trauma and mental health report. There's also a um, video that uh, you pointed out to me on YouTube um, to lecture on trauma therapy, which we'll have linked up. Robert, uh, I want to thank you so much. This has been awesome. Um, sure, your, sure. Your, your ability to, um, maybe that's why you're a professor, but your ability to convey, uh, you know, uh, 
sometimes complex information in a very easily digestible and uh, understandable way is um, is phenomenal and it's really appreciated. I want to thank you for uh, sharing your time um, and expertise w- with our listeners. Great. Yeah, it was a pleasure. Thank you so much. All right, all right sir. We'll be in touch. Okay, good. Whoosh.